morning. <clears throat> First Kings chapter number 19. read one verse and start there verse number 19 so he talking about Elijah departed thence and found Elisha the son of Shaphat who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him and he was and he with the 12th and Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him now you know first Kings chapter number 18 very famous chapter you know, the contest between the prophets of Baal and God. Right where Elijah said a very simple prayer, and he said, basically the prayer was this, Lord, you're wonderful, you're glorious, you deserve all honor and praise. I've followed the instructions that you gave me, and without a doubt, I've done what you told me to do, so you show up and do the rest, and then God sent fire down from heaven and consumed the sacrifice upon the altar, even though it had been drenched with water in the middle of a drought. In fact, it was so much water that they drug, dug a trench around it and that filled up with water and God licked all the water up out of that. The Bible says that it even licked the dust up off of the ground. Right? Well, then, everybody in Israel said, well, the Lord, he is the God. Okay? Elijah went out, slew the prophets of Baal and the prophets of the grove and then a wicked queen said that she's going to kill him and, you know, put a death threat on his head, basically put a bounty on his head said hey you're gonna die so then chapter number 19 another famous one Elijah finds himself underneath or Elijah finds himself underneath the juniper tree okay but we're not gonna talk about that okay and then we get all the way down verse number 19 of chapter number 19 okay God spoke to him he's encouraged him he said that he had 7,000 knees that hadn't bowed down or kissed Baal that you know there were still people like Elijah hanging around he said you're not the only one that's out there serving me he said I've still got some then he tells him to go anoint Jehu king over Israel then he says go and anoint this fellow who I can't Nim Nimshi perhaps I don't know but uh, or no not Nimshi that was Jehu's dead uh, Haze Hazael Hazael I don't know but he was going to be king over Syria okay and then he said, and go call Elisha to be your replacement, is what he told him. He said, he'll be prophet over Israel. So then, God goes on to give him a promise in verse number 17, it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay, and him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. In other words, he said, all the enemies of God are going to be sorted out. He said, don't worry about it, I've already got the plan. Just go do it. So then in verse number 19, Elijah departed thence. What did he do? He said, well, God's got it figured out. He told me to go find Elisha. I'm going to go find him. Well, what did he do? He departed and found Elisha. Okay, now, Elisha, another great prophet of God. Okay, with Elijah, most of the time people talk about the mantle. When it's Elijah's turn to go up in a chariot in a whirlwind of fire, okay, and then the mantle from Elijah fell, and then Elisha picked it up, took it, smoked the waters of Jordan like he saw Elijah do, and then the waters parted, and then he passed on across. But that was a picture of that the blessing that was upon Elijah, right, would now be on Elisha. What was that blessing? The presence of God. That as long as he's obedient, God would do for Elisha what he did for Elijah. But Elisha asked for a double portion. And that's, you know, the whole chapter, 2 Kings chapter number 2. You go study it out. Elijah said, if you stick with me and you don't depart from me until God takes me, it'll be so. He didn't say that if you pick up my mantle, it'll be so. He said, if you stay with me, 
go everywhere I go until God takes me, then you'll have a double portion. Wasn't anything special about the mantle. Okay? What was special was that Elisha was the only one that went with Elijah all the way. From the time that he called him in this chapter until God took Elijah, Elisha went everywhere with him, studied underneath of him, grew up. I mean, he was already a young man, but spiritually, he grew in the faith. Right? He had a first hand account of the prophet of God. And in this chapter, when Elisha threw the mantle on him, it didn't say that he just went up and said, Hey, are you like He knew it. God said that's him. So he said, Okay. He went up and he chucked the mantle on him. From that day, it was settled that if Elisha followed, he's going to be the next prophet. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. That's what God said. You shall anoint Elisha prophet over Israel. So from that day forward, he's going to be prophet. And when he asked to have a double portion of what? Elijah had Elijah said well God says if you follow me and you see me taken up it'll be so wasn't anything special about the mantle okay now I've heard people preach and teach on this before and refer to a mantle as a suit coat no 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 okay, this, this is what in the Bible would be referred to as a coat the mantle was the outermost garment Okay, it was usually the most expensive garment because it was meant to last. The mantle is what protected you from the elements. Okay, and you wanted it to last a while because you know, that's why it was expensive. You want one that's well made, that'll handle the elements. Now keep in mind, it hadn't rained in three years up until the chapter before this. And Elijah didn't really have a need to, you know, shelter from water okay but he did live in the Middle East okay well it's hot during the day yeah and it gets real cold when the sun goes down it's the thing about deserts there's both extremes there's no vegetation there's no you know it really is just barren there's nothing to trap the heat of the day and keep it until morning right last night one of them freak things where it was colder during the night last night than it's going to be during the day today. I mean, warmer last night than it's going to be today. But most of the time what happens, is it gets a little bit cooler, but because you've got things like trees, because you've got things like houses, because you have forest, it traps the heat of the day and keeps it from escaping. Well, you don't have that in the desert, so you've got to be prepared for both. It may not have rain, but there were sandstorms. Right? There's a when it starts blowing in the desert just like you go skiing snowboarding, sledding whatever you want to do just the wind alone can chap your cheeks now imagine it's throwing little tiny beads of glass at your face that's a sandstorm you had to cover your eyes and your face had to make sure you weren't breathing it in what did they use for that? they didn't use this they used a mantle okay now this too short mantle went longer okay mantle was supposed to cover you from everything sometimes it even drag on the ground depending on what kind you wanted right but then again if you're getting ready to walk across a dry patch maybe you know you spend a lot of time around rivers and stuff you don't want your mantle to go to point I'm trying to make it's specialized for it but it's meant to last it's meant to be well built in other words, he didn't just walk up and throw a t-shirt. Or this, this is very light. Okay, I know that y'all don't believe me because I get up here and I sweat every Sunday morning while I'm wearing it. But it's very light. Very, very I promise you, you walk outside in the cold and this thing, you're going to know it's cold outside. It's not going to do And the pants really aren't going to do much for you because they're silk lined. Yeah, they get real cold real quick. Right, this isn't going to protect you from anything. This is for, essentially, decoration. Right? I'm supposed to put on my best and come to the house of God. Right? But the mantle, that goes on, it protects the important, you know, the precious. I like this suit, made in the USA. It's one of my favorites. I try to take good care of this one. It's rare nowadays. Right? But I don't go out and face a rainstorm just wearing this. 
Now, if this gets wet, it could ruin it. I need something that's going to stand against it. I, I can throw up and, I mean, walk up and toss this on your shoulder. You may not notice it, depending on how focused you are on playing on the field. I thought about bringing my leather jacket because I'm convinced that that one's lined with lead or something. That thing's heavy. But I didn't want to do that because I was afraid if I tossed it at somebody, it might kill them. Right? And it's not long enough. Right? This right here be a mantle. Okay? It's almost as heavy as the leather one. But you'd know if somebody walked up and chucked this on your back. Right? It's not the heaviest thing in the world, but you'd pay attention. Especially if you was out in the middle of the field plowing with some oxen, somebody tossed this on you. Because it didn't say he tossed it to him. Okay, read again, verse number 19. It says, And Elijah passed him by and cast his mantle upon him. In other words, he walked up to him and said, That's him. Tossed it to him. They didn't toss it on the ground. It said, Toss it upon him. In other words, he had a decision to make. Everybody knew what that meant back in the day. Okay, if the man of God came by, everybody knew who a Elijah was. The king didn't even need to see him in order to know who it was. Go and read <laughs> that Ahab. He said, hey, there's a crazy guy down there. He's causing a whole bunch of trouble. And he says, what's he look like? He said, well, he's really hairy and he's, he's wearing not the best clothes. He said, that's Elijah. He knew who he was just hearing about him. Right? Especially after chapter number 18, where the man of God shows up and God does something miraculous sends fire down from heaven right people knew who Elijah was didn't have to know his name may just be hey there's this there's this crazy kind of like John the Baptist everybody didn't know what John the Baptist looked like they may not have been able to you know pick him out if they just saw him walking around but they said hey there's this crazy guy out in the middle of the woods wearing camel hair eating locusts and honey and he's preaching about God well, if you happen to be walking through the wilderness and you saw a guy wearing camel hair that was preaching up a storm while eating some locusts and honey, you'd be able to put two and two together. Now, people knew who Elijah was, even if they'd never seen him before. His fame had been enlarged by God. So when Elisha turned around and saw who it was, and he realized, oh, this is his mantle, he understood that he was anointing him to be the next prophet over Israel. He took it all in in a, in a moment. But it was very ceremonial back in the day. You know, Elijah didn't do it, you know, bring out the trumpets and cause a big commotion. He just walked by and threw his mantle on. But when a king would announce who was going to be the heir to his throne, they would take the mantle of the king and they'd have a big old ceremony and then they'd drape the mantle on the air. And that was the sign of a proof that this is the one that's going to rule after me okay if there was a lord over a house he had many sons let's say the eldest he had to put him out because he wasn't doing you know what he was supposed to or maybe he was a prodigal or whatever maybe he'd been disowned maybe he died maybe it was his only son well to announce who was going to be the next heir he'd put his manhole upon somebody else okay it's very symbolic it's just part of their culture back then so Elisha knew what was happening. And when he saw the mantle, he didn't keep it. He gave it back to Elijah. That was Elijah's mantle. He understood the symbolism, but then he said, okay, I'm coming with you. He says, you know, can I go? Verse number 20 says, let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow thee. And he said unto him, go back again, for what have I done to thee? And he returned back with him, took a yoke of oxen, and slew them, and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen, and gave unto the people, and they did eat. Then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. He's throwing a celebration. He's saying, God's man just called me to be the next prophet. So he goes and he kisses his mom and his dad. He slays the oxen as a sacrifice, boils the flesh, gives it to the people. Okay, then he follows after Elijah. But see, Elijah says in verse number 20, What have I done to thee? He says, I'm not the one that threw the mantle on you. He said, I'm just following instructions here. I'm doing what God told me to do. I didn't do this to you. God did this to you. 
What he's telling them is, I had to make a decision whether I was going to do what God said. That's why I threw the mail on you. Because God told me to. He said, now you got to decide whether or not you're going to answer the call. And he said, just let me go tell everybody bye. Because he knew this was a lifetime endeavor. He knew he may not see mother and father again. He's getting ready to throw away everything. That's why he sacrificed the oxen. He said, there's nothing here left for me anymore. That's how he made his living. He was a field hand. How can you plow a field if you just got rid of your oxen? He was saying, my old life is behind me. Let me say goodbye to it. And then we can head on out. I just said, okay. Then from that point forward, you don't find where Elijah was that Elisha wasn't. But nowhere do you find that Elisha is wearing the mantle of Elijah. That was Elijah's mantle. Gave it back to him. Okay, so, all that in mind, we're going to talk on today, putting on your mantle. Your mantle. Elisha didn't have a mantle till 2 Kings chapter number 2. That's where you find that Elijah's taken up in a whirlwind of fire, and the mantle falls to the ground. Well, Elijah's gone. Elijah doesn't know where he went, but God took him somewhere. And wherever God took him, he didn't need the mantle no more. That's why the mantle stayed. But say again, we already talked about the blessing wasn't in the mantle. There wasn't anything special about it. Right? There's nothing special about the Bible that our pastor uses compared to the one that you have. Other than the fact that it's got a whole lot of, well, not, maybe not the one that he's got today. There's one that's got a whole lot of notes in it, and I've already caught dibs on it, and Sydney and Christian can fight me for it, and they're going to lose. It's, I'm the eldest, that's what I'm claiming is my birthright. Okay? I'm trying to talk him out of, you know, having it now so that I can have it now. But anyway, I'd have to get a new cover for it, because that's why I switched to the new one. The alligator's falling off. I'd find something for it. It'd be all right. But there's nothing special. It's just the Word of God. It's just as much the Word of God as any KJV version that you got. Now, there's nothing, spe nothing special about this coat today other than the fact that it's probably a whole lot bigger than the one that you got because I got big shoulders. And I'm starting to get a big tummy. Right? But there's nothing special about this. What nothing special about Elijah's coat? In fact, if Elisha was being honest, he probably could have gone out and bought a much better coat. Well, I just could have seen some stuff. It had been through some storms, some trials. You find that, that Elijah took the mantle and wrapped it around his face when he went into that cave that God instructed him to. And even with, you know, the whirlwind and the lightning and the thunder and all the commotion that God caused to happen in that cave, despite all that commotion and despite having the mantle wrapped around his head, Elijah still heard this still small voice. God said, we're going to cause a big commotion and we're going to cause you to go part deaf. To understand it's not in what happens around you, it's what in God says to you. Didn't end the big commotion that God talks, it's in a still small voice. Elisha knew that. He knew where that mantle had been. He knew what that mantle had gone through. He knew the good times and the low times. He knew that mantle was there when Elijah prayed the first time and it stopped raining for three years. He knew it was there the second time when he prayed and he saw a cloud the size of a man's hand and he said, hey, go tell the king it's going to rain. That mantle was with him when Elijah was praying on top of the mountain and then ran down and outran the king's chariot which was being pulled by horses. He outran the, the flood that was coming because of the water. You gotta be pretty quick. God was all over him on that one. Right? God have to be all over me for me to run that fast nowadays. Not to mention for as far as he did. Whatever marathon they had back in the day, Elijah would have won it that day. Right? He's booking it. But that mantle was with him. Right? When he went out into the wilderness and he was fed by the ravens, that mantle was there. Elijah knew there might be one that's better made. There might be one that you know, looks a little bit nicer. This one, the colors may have been faded a little bit from sleeping out underneath of the stars a few nights. This one might smell like campfire smoke. 
because he's been exiled by the king and the queen. He's had to live on the lamb, essentially. But this one's also soaked in the grace of God and the mercy of God. It's got the power of God on it. He said, I can go out and buy one, but it's not going to be the same as this one. He said, that was the mantle that God told him to throw on me to show that I was the one that God called to go after him. In other words, he's saying, it'd be a pretty good reminder for everybody else to remember that the one that called me was the one that got taken up in the chariot of fire. The one that called me was the one that God used to say a prayer and then God sent down fire from heaven. He's saying it's a reminder to others. I didn't just wake up one day and decide I'm going to be the next prophet. The last prophet called me. But the one that everybody else knew had God on him said that God was going to have a touch on me. Right? It was symbolic in that nature as well. It had that sentimentality to it. There's also security in knowing that this went everywhere with the last man of God. You know, by the will of God, it's going to go everywhere with me. It's a symbol of God's protection. That everybody in the world basically wanted to kill Elijah or Elijah, but they couldn't do it because God said it couldn't happen. It didn't just protect against the elements. It didn't just protect against cold nights. Right? It was a symbolism of the fact that God had a bigger protection around him that no man, you know, no other God that not even Elijah himself, if he lost his mind, could have broke that protection. Uh, well, all that being said, okay, because of all that, it may have been heavy, but it is a lot heavier than just what it weighed. There's responsibility in that mantle. There's expectations in that mantle. Okay, there's a burden in that mantle. You know why in chapter number 19 in the first part where you find Elijah up underneath that juniper tree? You know why he's so heartbroken? It's not because a woman said that she's going to kill him. We don't know that woman happened to be the queen. Right? It wasn't because he felt like he was all alone. Just like Jeremiah, he's heartbroken for it. He thinks that all of Israel had sold out to Baal. He's broken because he said, I've just seen God do the most powerful thing that he's ever done in my life or in anybody's life that I've heard of to show that he is God. And yet all these people still seared against following and worshiping after God. In other words, I've heard it said around here a few times, how can you sit through that and not get right with God? Right? How can we have the services we've had around here and people not move closer to God? Elijah got into that mindset for a little bit. He says, if that didn't do it, what will? He's heartbroken. He says, there's no hope for him anymore, God. You do something like that, if they don't respond to that, what else could you do? And then God came along first. He gave him a meal. It was a pretty good meal. It lasted for 40 days. I've never eaten a meal so good that I didn't eat again for 40 days. But Elijah did. Right, and then he took him to that Okay, but it gives them the promise. He says, there's a whole bunch out there. You don't even know about them, but they're still mine. They still follow after me. They love me. They haven't bowed down to Baal, haven't kissed the statue of Baal. Right? It sounds a whole lot like them saints that are going to get in through the great tribulation that didn't bow down to the Antichrist, didn't take the mark of the beast, didn't associate with something that they knew was wrong. Right? He says, they may be out in caves. They may be you know, out in the wilderness living off of the land. But he says, but they're mine. And he says, all hope's not me. He says, there's still people out there that love me. There's still hope. Because Elijah knows that if they don't get right with God, God's going to destroy them. I mean, what did he promise him? He said, those that the Syrian king doesn't kill, the Israelite king will kill. And those that those two don't kill, Elisha's going to kill. He knows that those that stand against God aren't long for this world. He's broken because he wants them to get right. There's that weight. That burden was passed on to Elisha. Now it's Elisha's job to go out and say, Thus saith the Lord to the people of God. He doesn't just want to go out and sound robotic. Right? When he picked up that mantle, he's taking up that burden. 
He was the one that would speak to God's people for God. I don't find another prophet in the time of Elisha. It's just him. That man, he had a lot of ground to cover. It meant there was a lot of places that he might have to go. There's a lot of things that he might have to face. But through it all, when he picked up that mantle, he said, it's worth it because of the burden that God's given me. It's for, God's, it's for my people, my family, my friends, people that live in my town, my country. That is a whole lot heavier to put that mantle on than just what it weighed. I mean, I put that on this morning and it didn't break my back. It weighs a little something, but that's just because it's made out of wool. It's made to last, made to repel water, made to keep you warm. That all the things I needed today. That the mantle will help you, but the mantle will also put a weight on you. Well, you say, well, but Jordan, that was Elisha's mantle. Yep. Well, what about our mantle? Revelation, God calls us kings and priests. You guys ever go and study? We don't have time to get into it. That's preached on it several times. But you ever go study out what the high priest garments were that he had to wear when he went into the holiest of holies and put that blood of that spotless lamb onto the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant? You ever study out? Because he only put that on once a year. The whole outfit that he had to keep clean and pure and ready. And then when it would come time for the sake, he'd get it out, make sure there wasn't any, you know, dust on it, rust on it, that moths didn't get to it. Right? And I mean, go study it. God only devoted about three or four chapters just to the garment that this priest was supposed to wear when he went into the holiest of holies. You study it out. He had clothing, but he also had a breastplate, he had a headpiece. You know what those were made out of? Silver and gold and precious gems. The garment had gold woven into it. You know how heavy gold is? Now imagine wearing it. Right? That priest knew when he put that on, God's about, you know, this is serious business. Imagine it's the first time you've ever put that garment on. They put the garment on and you think, man, this is heavier than most other garments. Well, yeah, it's got gold in it. But then they put that breastplate on you and you're thinking, man, this is serious business. God was serious about what he, you know, he said, well, of course, they meant he was serious. Because God said, you do it wrong, he'd kill you. Right, but as he puts it on, that responsibility and the weight of all that God has entrusted to him, all the hopes of Israel to have their sins pushed back for a year are on this guy's hands. If he doesn't do it right, he's going to die, but then somebody else is going to have to do this. And if they don't get it right, God's not going to push the sins of Israel back for a year. It's a very sobering weight. I mean, at one point, Israel stopped doing that sacrifice because they stopped following after God. But somewhere, that garment, that breastplate, that headpiece, when he had a big old necklace with two huge gemstones in them called the Um and Thum, those things, I mean... You get a rock about this big and then put it on a necklace that's big enough to hold it, throw that around your neck. You know it. Right? Well, God gave us priestly garments. Our mantle, it's got that weight to it. See, here's the thing. I can take that little purple jacket back yonder that's hanging on that seat. That don't weigh nothing. That looks like it's made out of fleece. Right? That'll keep you a little warm. But it doesn't weigh anything. I almost bought, brought about four jackets with me this morning, but I decided I didn't want to carry them all. But fleece jacket, we all know fleece jacket. It's light because it's made out of fleece. You can have one of them fleece blankets, fold the whole thing up, put it in your pocket. It weighs so light if you can get it that small. Right? Fleece light. Not a lot of responsibility in the fleece jacket. Well, how many of us wake up, we just want to put on the fleece? When we say, well, this is what God's going to be happy with. Well, is that what God said? Well, it's easier to wear. It moves a little bit easier than that leather jacket that Brother Jordan wears. Yeah. It's more flexible. But sometimes I need to rein in the flesh. I don't need to be as flexible in certain things as I may want to be. 
to him that knoweth to do good and doeth not, to him that is it. You get a mantle that's got some weight on it, you're going to think twice before you reach out for something because it takes a little bit of effort. Well, you're not running a marathon in a mantle. That is not wise. Probably going to die of a heat stroke if anything else. You're going to get hot real quick. Right? Well, this, this weighs a little bit more than that fleece does. Maybe that's what God gave me, but I didn't put everything else on with it. There were multiple pieces for that priest. First, he had his undergarments. Right? Then he had the tunic. He had a robe. Then he had the chest piece. He had that giant neck. He had the head piece. Then they'd tie a rope around his waist so that if he did die, that they'd be able to pull him out because they weren't allowed to go into the holiest of holies. Right? Each one of those things got a little bit heavier. He didn't get to say one day, well, you know what, that ne my neck's hurting today, boys. Uh, I don't think we're going to put on the, uh, the ornament today, the necklace. Uh, just leave that off. You know why that necklace was so important? Because God would speak, and the Bible says His voice is a voice of many rushing waters, many thunderings, right? Very loud, hard for our human ears to make out. Well, you study it out, those two gemstones would resonate and vibrate when God would speak and the priest would be able to hear what God said. If he leaves his necklace off, he doesn't hear from God. Not to mention the fact that he died because he didn't do everything that God said to do. But how many of us daily, spiritually, we die because we leave something off? It's too cumbersome today. I don't want to put on my mantle today. You know, it's really not all that cold. I can get by with the fleece jacket today. I can get by with, you know, just a, a pea coat today. If you're like me, I can get by with just wearing short sleeves and a pair of shorts outside today. But I like it cold. But see, vice versa. Sometimes it may be convenient to wear the mantle on a day like today. But when you got to wake up and put that on when it's 80 degrees outside, it may not be convenient. When the heat gets turned up in your, in your life, you may not want to put on all the pieces that God gave you. Right? But it's critical. Each one of those things, the breastplate, right? We already, we already talked about the necklace that the priest wore. That was so that he could hear God. Right? The headpiece was to remind him of the weight that was on literally his head. Right? It separated him from the other priest. It said, this is on you, not for, from everybody else. The breastplate, you go to study all the colors on there. Right? There was blue, there was red, there was purple. You go and study it out. You know what all three of them are? pictures of Jesus that one day the perfect lamb would come right his attire was spotless white right woven throughout without seam you know what that is it's not taking any shortcuts you know what this is right here that's a seam because they didn't want to make one suit out of one piece of fabric what it was is if you're going to do it do it right but it was also pictures of God's righteousness. There's no shortcuts to get to God's righteousness, to holiness. Right? And obviously the color was that it was that he had purified himself before God, that he wasn't going in with sinful hands. Right? Well, he called us to be priests. Why? So that we could enter directly into the throne room of God and talk to him. Part of your mantle is that not only you listen to God, you talk to Him. Not just when you pray. Pray without ceasing. I honestly believe that as Elijah's, or Elijah's walking around the woods, he's just talking to God all the time. When he's prepared to talk to God, God talked back. When he was under the juniper tree, he wasn't ready yet. But when he was ready, God sent an angel. God gave him instructions, and then God talked to him down at the cave. But when we put on the mantle, we're in the right spot. When we're prepared to do business with God, God listens and God speaks. 
See, part of that priestly mantle is this one, because that's where it speaks to us from. Part of that priestly mantle is the state of mind that, you know, the gumption that, come what may, I'm going to get a hold of God no matter what it takes, no matter how long it takes, regardless of what interruptions happen. Right? The dedication. To do God was pretty dedicated to tell us what He wanted us to know. You trace the history of how that ended up in your lap. God was pretty serious and dedicated about making sure you knew what thus saith the Lord. Well, how dedicated are you about bearing those burdens that He said to cast upon Him? How long are you willing to wait in order to know that you've said all that God wanted you to say? Because when I unload my burdens, then I can get rid of them things that are weighing me down, that are stressing me out, that are keeping me awake at night. And instead, I can refocus on what God wants me to focus on. Burdens grab my attention. But the mantle reminds me that there's a burden that's greater than anything I'm going through. That's the burden that He gave me. Well, what's that? Well, part of that other mantle. Right? It identifies you. Everybody saw Elisha wearing the mantle and they knew that's the new prophet. How do we know that you're the prophet? You see this mantle? Last one gave it to me. He passed it on. But were they not called Christians first at Antioch? Because they were Christ-like? Our mantle identifies us as one of them. Now that Davy Shelton's on, yes, I'm one of them today. One of who? One of the ones that, well, he left a mantle behind for me. I picked it up. I put it on. You can live without the mantle, but you're going to be miserable. Because not only is there identification in that mantle, but there's isolation in that mantle. We're a peculiar people. We're called to be separated. That mantle keeps us from being like the rest of the world. That mantle reminds me that I'm not good enough on my own. I need this mantle in order to identify with Christ. There's no good thing in me besides, you know, the Holy Spirit. Because He indwells me now after I got saved. There's nothing good about me. Everything good about me, right now, I have on lease until I get to heaven and I get a body like His. Right? That mantle, without it, People wouldn't know that I'm one of Christ. That I'm part of the bride of Christ that we heard about on Wednesday night. Right? That I'm one of them that one of these days is going to a marriage supper and I'm going to get a garment that he's prepared just for me. Right? And as our pastor said, what's the point of the garment? It reflects the bridegroom. Well, what's that mantle? Why does it associate us? It's going to isolate you from the world. But when God looks at you, he sees the sun. See, we are robed in His righteousness. What do you think that is? That's just God putting a mantle on us. Saying, here, this will keep you through everything that you need right now. Because on your own, you couldn't get the grace and the mercy of God. But see, with that mantle, there's a weight to that. See, God predestined that all those that got saved would be conformed to the image of His Son. There's an expectation in that mantle. It was expected that Elisha would have what God needed for the people of Israel to hear. Well, when I'm robed in it, when I put that mantle on, it's expected that I be like Christ. That's a high bar. Right? If you ever sit down and think about, well, there's probably a lot of things that I do. God may wink at our ignorance, but how many times a day am I not like Christ? A whole lot more than I am like Christ. There's the weight of knowing that God wants something better for you, but you have to choose it. If you don't want to be like Him, you take the mantle off. Well, then when God looks at you, He doesn't see His Son. Not saying you can lose your salvation, but you can lose the blessings and goodness of God in your life. He'll chase you to get you back to where you are with the mantle on. And the story of the prodigal son, first thing he did, what did he do when the son came home? He went out, he didn't tell him to change. Didn't tell him to go get washed up. As filthy and as dirty as he was, he put a ring on his finger and put a robe on him. The Bible says the best. 
He wasn't worried about what the son would do to the robe. He wanted the son to be robed in something that belonged to the father. That God's not worried about us hurting the righteousness of Jesus. That can't happen. He's holy. But when he robed us in it, there's the expectation that I chose to put this on because I knew I wasn't good enough. So I must conform to what God wants me to be because only Jesus is good enough. Right? You put that mantle on, you start thinking about the cost of what it took to give you that mantle. Past two Sunday mornings, we've heard about all that Christ suffered and endured to go to the cross. Not to mention the things that we can never know. I don't know how heavy of a burden it was to descend into hell, go up to the devil and say, give me the keys to death and hell. I don't know what that was like. I don't know what it's like to say, I've been completely forsaken by everyone, including God. Jesus can. I didn't. The pain and the agony and the torture. When you put that robe on, that mantle, you start thinking about them things. That I was bought with a price. Price far higher than I could ever pay. It inspires love, affection, empathy towards those that know nothing about the love of God. Because see, the love of God is something sweet to talk about, but when you really start thinking and digging into the love of God, you realize how much God has sacrificed in order to love you. That's a heavy mantle. You're going to know if you've got that mantle on. And you're going to know if you don't. Okay, I mean, had a whole bunch of other things that we could get into. There's not just the expectation. There's not just the price of what the mantle was. Right, but there is the decision. We've already said, Elisha didn't need the mantle. There wasn't anything special about that mantle. Right, that God wasn't in the mantle. God was in heaven. But when it fell from that chariot of fire, he said, well, if Elisha doesn't need it, it served him pretty good. I'll just stick with it. In other words, he's saying, if it isn't broke, don't fix it. Elisha didn't add anything to the mantle. Didn't take anything off of the mantle. Didn't substitute anything. He didn't say, well, maybe if we take the mantle and we take the lining out, it'd be a little bit lighter to wear around in the hot. Yeah, until it gets cold. Then you're going to be wishing for the lining back. But this mantle doesn't have any pockets because I'm supposed to lay up my treasures in heaven. I'm not supposed to be collecting things around on the world to take with me. There's nothing here that I should desire to take with me. Everything I want is set before me. But this mantle, it just gets kind of itchy every now and then. I'm sure it was uncomfortable for Jesus walking up the hill to Calvary too. This flesh isn't going to like putting that mantle on. It's going to irk the flesh. There are going to be times that the flesh wants to do this, but the mantle says, you know, you ought to do that. It's not always going to be convenient to put the mantle on. And it may cause your flesh to get uncomfortable. But it's always right to put the mantle on. Well, if we could just get one made out of fleece, God didn't pay for the fleece one. God paid for one. That was the one that He gave you. Right, Elisha, the mantle was just a symbol to call him. Mantle really was a symbol of what God had already done, that he was just trusting that God was going to keep doing it. He said, I don't need anything new. I believe God can just use the things that he's always used. Right? Don't need a new interpretation. Don't need a new opinion. I just want to know what God says. Right? But for us, I, much as I want to, I could try and put on that purple jacket, it's going to rip. I guarantee you that. If I did get my arms into it, there's no way I'm zipping it. I can assure you of that. Or that little black one with the leopard trim on it. That's not going to fit me. Right? You know why Elisha could take the mantle? Because God knew that it would fit him. You can't put on my mantle. I can't put on your mantle. Whatever mantle God gave you, go with that one. Now, likewise, Sister Sharon could get up here and try and put on my overcoat. It's not going to fit her. 
It's going to be dragging around behind her, one. And two, it's going to swallow her up. Better, better yet, if we brought Joseph in here, right? I'd be able to wrap it in half and fold him up in it. But see, that's my mantle. It's not yours. Just like I can't wear Brother Brian's or I can't wear Brother Rod's or anybody else's. Because he's a personal guy. He personally made it for you. And he personally left it for you. He bestowed it upon you. Okay, it wasn't just a gift. He said, this is a part of you. And when we take it off, we're robbing ourselves of the new creature. He said, this isn't just a garment. This is what gives you access to me. This is what associates you with me. This is what shows the price that I paid for you. How much you mean to me. This is to remind you of your burden that we talked about. What was the burden? To go. The tab preached really great on that on Sunday night. Right? The people, people that don't have a burden anymore, it's because they've taken part of their mantle off. Those that you know, look down upon sinners and want to condemn them, they've lost part of that mantle. Because Jesus was the friend of publicans and sinners. My mantle is supposed to remind me that I'm to have compassion on them as Christ showed compassion to me. That they may have done some wicked things, but if they want to hear what the gospel says, they're not going to be what they were. God will make them into something new. There's no telling what God can do if people just want to be used to God. Maybe God wants to tell that person because they're more willing to go than the ones that have already gotten the mantles. Because if everybody that's got a mantle had already gone, there'd be a whole lot more people with them. A whole lot more people that would have heard. But for some reason, people don't like their mantle. Maybe heavy. May get a little too hot during the day and it may get a little cold at night. But if you've got the mantle, he said he'd never leave you nor forsake you. Because the moment I take it off, what I'm saying is everything that I chose to put on, this is what happened. Night that you got saved, God was walking by you, and you was under conviction, and He threw the mantle on you. He said, if you want it, it's yours. And you said, what I've got is not good enough. I want the mantle. And when you take it off, what you're saying is, I want to go back to what I used to be. I don't need the mantle no more. I've outgrown the mantle. Mantles, you know, it, it's just too cumbersome. I can't move, I can't bend my arms as well when I'm wearing that. Because I got a lot of stuff on. But it's harder to reach for, especially if I got gloves on. Can't use the cell phone if I got my gloves on. They say that you can use it with the touch screen. They lied. Doesn't work. Right, if I'm fully kitted up to go out in the snow, I'm leaving some things behind. In fact, I dropped Sid off under the thing. I didn't carry this in with my gloves on on the off chance that I'd have dropped it and it got wet. I dropped Sid off at the front door. I said, "Go, can you take this in for me? Right, the mantle changes your perception of things. Well, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to have to learn how to do it a different way. I'm going to have to get accustomed to doing things the way that God wants me to do them instead of the way that I've always done them. I'm not going to have the reach that I had. Right? I'm going to have to learn to do only what I can do and not try to overreach, but to let God do what only He can do. The mantle is part of that new creature. Because if I don't have it, I'm not a king or a priest. And there's a reason that the old saying is, uneasy rests the head that wears the crown. It's not because the crown's heavy, it's because of all the burden and the responsibility that's in the crown. Everything that's been put at your feet that you are now accountable for. But putting the mantle on, it's heavy. It's got weight to it. But he said to take his yoke upon you because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. That mantle's a whole lot lighter than bearing the burden of my sin. That mantle's a whole lot lighter than bearing the consequences of those things that I've done before I got saved. That mantle's a whole lot lighter than 
dealing with the consequences of sins that I've done after I've got saved. It's just better to stick to the mantle. And you study it out, the mantle's got some armor in there for you. You'll be all right. The mantle's got some meals in there for you. Psalm 23. Enemy can be all around you, but that mantle may have some food tucked away that God put in there. He'll put out a feast before your enemies. You study up. First thing Elisha did when he picked it up was the thing that he saw Elijah do. He wrapped up the mantle, he smoked the waters of Jordan, and they parted just like they did for Elijah. See, he could have done it with a stick. Could have chucked a rock out there. Said, Lord, part the waters. But see, he wanted the mantle. He said, I know that works. He says, I don't know. Maybe not, don't know why it works. But God said it works, so that's good enough for me. He just had faith that what was good enough for God before would be good enough for God now. He said, I just want to be usable by God. Don't want to look the best. Don't want to have the best reputation. I don't want people to like me, so to speak. I want God to be happy in my life. Or happy with my life. He says, I just want to be given to Him, and He can use me however. Well, I can tell you that this, this still works. The mantle still works. And it's worked since Christ gave both of them. So just stick with it. I promise you, it'll take you all the way to glory. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.